<clears throat> okay, I think we can start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to the Festival of Ideas event on heritage and repatriation. Um, I just wanted to say hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Angelica Basquiera and I work at SOAS in the Centre Institute office and I've been involved in the organization of the festival. Uh, in particular, I have some research interests in Swahili manuscripts um, and, I've, um, and I've done some work around uh, the debate on heritage and repatriation. Therefore, uh, I am very, very pleased to be here today to welcome uh, our panelists. Um, and um, just to say, this is the second panel uh, on the issue, on the topic of heritage and repatriation that we are hosting as part of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. Um, the SOAS Festival of Ideas main theme is decolonizing knowledge. And um, as you probably um, know by now, if you've been following um, the festival that started on Monday, uh, so the big theme is heritage and repatriation, uh, sorry, it's the colonized knowledge. And then um, we would like to look at this uh, very broad theme from different perspectives. Um, and as you've seen from the program of the festival, there were a lot of different um, presentation and panels discussing this theme. Uh, here we are looking at the angle of heritage and repatriation of our African artifacts. Um, in fact, as you probably know, the previous panel was looking also at um, Asia, especially um, Tibet. Today we, have, uh, we are focusing um, on Africa uh, and we are looking in particular at two uh, main projects um, that have been uh, um, looking at this, uh, this issue of uh, heritage and repatriation. Therefore, today um, it will be um, a discussion from, um, yes, a theoretical aspect and a debate, but also looking at actual practitioner examples of how we can um, we can actually do um, repatriation and how we can really sort of move on from this um, uh, topic that has been on the table for uh, 30 years, 40 years, if you're looking at um, you know, the repatriation of uh, Greek artifacts from the British Museum or in, in Egypt. Um, so it's a debate has been there for a long time. It's not new, uh, however, um, these two projects that we are discussing today are fairly recent and they are very interesting in their respect. Uh, I'm not going to take too much time because we have to go through um, four presentations and also a short animation. I'll introduce now the first speaker. Um, the first speaker is uh, Mr. Onyekachi Wambo, the director of AFORD. AFORD is the Africa Foundation for Development. Um, and uh, today, Onyekachi, as well as Paul Asquith, also part of AFORD, uh, both of them, they will uh, talk to us about the um, flagship uh, project in this area, which is called the Returns of the Icons. Um, it's a very, very interesting and um, innovative um, project um, and um, so I will now uh, pass the, um, the floor to Onyekachi first and then that will be followed by Paul that will discuss the return of the icons and then afterwards I will introduce the other two speakers that will be here today who are going to present about another project um, focusing on East Africa called Mangi Meli Remains Project. Uh, I am not going to say too much now because um, I want to give the floor uh, to the speakers um, for them to, to tell us all about it. Um, just a few words to say that please put your question in the Q&A section of, um, of the Zoom, uh, preferably not in the chat, and do feel free to start to put questions as we're going along. Uh, as they come into your head, write them down, put them in the Q&A box, and then we will reconvene uh, after the presentations to have a discussion where I will pick the questions um, from there. Um, so with no further ado, uh, let me pass on to Mr. Onikachi Wambu, director of AFORD, to start discussing um, their work on heritage and repatriation, in particular through the Returns of the Icons project. Thank you very much. And Onikachi, 
the floor is yours. Thanks, Angelica. Uh, thanks, Angelica, and uh, thanks for the invite um, today to to discuss discuss this really important issue. Um, Paul, please stay on because I'm going to call on you to make the initial um, presentation about the return of the icons. So, Paul Asquith, if you can come back on. Yes, so um, Return of the Icons in, in, is really a, a Ford's campaign to um, focus on restitution of African, um, looted African artifacts and also um, human remains that are in British cultural institutions. Um, the looted artifacts uh, have been expanding since we began the project. Um, last earlier this week, we had um, people who were concerned about the moving image um, um, from African, uh, former African colonies, and you know, current filmmakers that are in British archives that they would like seen to see returned as well. So, um, the the focus of it is expanding. But as the first thing that we did as part of the Return of the Icons project was to do a mapping, which uh, Paul Asquith. Uh, undertook um, for Ford. Um, and so Paul will just give you a sense of the mapping initially, and also um, the key recommendations that came out. And then I will follow up very quickly at the end with how we're taking forward the outcomes and recommendations from the mapping. So Paul, if you could just um, give us a digest of the mapping. Thank you very much, Onyakachi, and good morning or good afternoon or even good evening to all of you uh, who are with us here today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be able to join this fascinating discussion. Uh, as Onyakachi said, uh, uh, at Afford, we've been uh, implementing this program called Return of the Icons, which has been looking at restitution of uh, stolen African artifacts and human remains uh, from UK cultural institutions, museums, and the barriers to achieving that. Uh, this was a piece of research that we conducted between January and May of this year. And I think it's fair to say that certainly when we started out the research, we weren't expecting it to have quite as much poignancy and relevance as it uh, went on to do, uh, especially in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, also the toppling of statues on both sides of the Atlantic. So as part of this uh, research project, what we did is we spoke to diaspora communities and museum professionals. Uh, we surveyed uh, 184 diaspora respondents uh, about their attitudes to restoration of stolen uh, African artifacts. Uh, we also conducted a number of focus group discussions and we completed semi-structured interviews with uh, 22 museum professionals and diaspora experts. Now, in terms of our main findings, well, uh, predictably, perhaps the overwhelming majority, so nearly 80% of respondents from the diaspora felt that stolen African artifacts and human remains should be returned. Uh, also interesting was that there was a very high level of engagement with diaspora respondents, uh, with uh, museums or galleries. Uh, over 40% had visited a museum or gallery in the last year, which was consistent with user engagement surveys from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport that they do each year. Uh, and uh, what we found was that the processes for return of human remains are far better developed uh, than for artifacts and that there are models of good practice that are already in use for return of human remains that could and should, in our view, be extended to stolen artifacts. Uh, I think it's also important to stress that all the museum uh, professionals we spoke to stress the need for their institutions to deal with remains and artifacts with dignity. Um, and all of them also uh, stated and prompted, I should stress, that they supported the decolonization agenda, which is of particular relevance to our discussion here today. Most interesting from our perspective was that the number of formal requests for return of artifacts was very limited. Some institutions had had, had very few, if any, requests. And linked to this is that uh, many institutions have not fully catalogued the African artifacts they hold. Uh, uh, the research also identified uh, principal barriers uh, for return, uh, and perhaps the obvious one to talk about is the legal restrictions on national collections that prevent them from returning stolen artifacts. Uh, but also interesting from our point of view and very relevant for our discussion here today is uh, a gap in perception between diaspora communities and museum professionals and the wider UK public on the issue of returns. Although uh, the recent Black Lives Matter protests and 
uh, the toppling of statues suggests that perhaps this gap isn't quite so big uh, as many people thought it would be. Uh, the research identified that there were four main pathways for return, which Onikachi will talk about how we're going to take those forward uh, shortly, but they are changes in law through Parliament, uh, legal test cases to try and sort of challenge the existing legal restrictions, voluntary return agreements and other forms of return, such as revolving or long term loans uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and then in terms of our recommendations, uh, we developed quite a detailed list of 22 recommendations. I'm not going to talk through all of them now, but I think it's worthwhile to present uh, maybe four kind of areas of recommendation. Uh, the first of which is that uh, museums and other cultural institutions here in the UK need to uh, catalogue what they're holding. There's an awful lot of African artefacts uh, that are sitting unloved and undisplayed in basements. Um, and uh, it's an important first step for us that uh, these institutions should know what they hold because then there can be some discussions about what happens to those artifacts. Uh, the other kind of major recommendation from our side was that uh, uh, museums and other cultural institutions need to engage more actively with diaspora communities who have uh, uh, their own uh, connections, their own links to these artefacts. Uh, and uh, there was a real interest from our diaspora respondents in, in that engagement. So it's about what uh, schemes or pathways uh, can museums and institutions create to enable that to happen. And I suppose the final area of recommendations I'd, I'd want to draw attention to, which is more linked to uh, UK government's foreign policy, which is about developing a slightly broader view uh, of uh, uh, relations, uh, particularly post-Brexit, uh, with uh, nations in the global south, especially for our purposes in Africa, uh, and that uh, cultural heritage should form part of those bilateral discussions. I mean, we uh, had some interesting uh, discussions with the Ethiopian government uh, and the Ethiopian embassy here in London, as well as with the uh, uh, embassy of Benin in France about their experiences in this regard. Uh, and uh, there is an increasing interest from African governments in uh, bilateral diplomacy around these issues. So that in a nutshell is uh, uh, our findings uh, from the Return of the Icons program. I'm now gonna hand over to Onikachi who will talk about how we propose to take those forward. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. We we don't have um, a lot of time to uh, enable others to give their presentations, but I'll, I'll just focus very quickly on how we're taking forward some of this work. Um, the diaspora professionals and others that we have engaged with are really keen on working with institutions to see how they can support return. Um, there are two issues. One is getting this stuff or, or getting the principle of return acknowledged and beginning a process of return. And then there's another um, issue involved, which is on the other side in, in terms of the African context, ensuring that the cultural institutions there, the museums and others are, uh, are fit for purpose and can preserve and protect these uh, um, valuable valuable treasures when they are returned. So we, we want to put together a group of diaspora professionals that can help um, particularly um, improve conditions uh, in Africa, but also help with um, um, lobbying efforts in the in the UK. And as part of that, uh, Afford is seeing itself as a kind of uh, and a network or facilitating a network of different campaigns. There's so many, there's a campaign that is trying to get the heads of um, diaspora heroes, I'm sorry, uh, Zimbabwean heroes, uh, liberation heroes in the first uh, war of independence in the uh, late 19th century returned. Um, the, the, those heads are currently in boxes uh, in an institution in the UK. Um, and then there are other campaigns around the Benin Bond bronzes, there are other uh, campaigns, as Paul just mentioned, around the Ethiopian um, artifacts that were looted after the Magdala incident, um, in, again in the 19th century. And then there are other, there's the Egyptian campaign. So we're trying to see whether we can uh, facilitate a network that brings together all those campaigns so that they can share and learn from each other. And then we also um, looking at out of all those campaigns, can we identify, identify one that we can then proceed towards a test case to see 
um, what indeed uh, the law thinks about um, uh, having looted uh, um, artifacts in the in the in these uh, cultural ar ar archives. I mean, there was a test case um, that did lead to a change in the law. So there was a precedent with um, uh, um, Nazi looted uh, artifacts that were dis uh, discovered in the British Museum and the law was subsequently changed in the last uh, 15 years to make sure that no looted artifacts can now be stored any in any, um, no looted Nazi artifacts could be stored in any uh, UK cultural institution. So, and then we're looking at specific return um, items, whether voluntary otherwise, I mean, Paul identified these four pathways. So there's the voluntary path and and um, I know SOAS in this context uh, has started talking about ways of um, initiating um, a sharing or return of uh, Swahili and some other manuscripts. So we'd like to engage with institutions such as um, so as that are beginning the process of trying to return this. And then, as I said, ensuring that at both ends, the African end, that um, these these uh, artifacts can be preserved and protected and, and looked after once they are returned. So those are some of the ways that we're going to be taking uh, forward those institutions, but uh, of vital, vital importance is the partnerships that we are beginning to develop with African institutions on the ground, so that um, you know that that process becomes seamless between the UK and Africa. Um, thank you very much, Onyekachi and Paul. Uh, in fact, I realize if you um, don't mind um, audience and uh, further speakers, I actually, as a chair, I should have introduced a little bit more um, the profile of uh, Onyekachi Wambo and Paul Asquid. So if you let me, I would like to say a few words uh, retrospectively, um, just, to bear, uh, just to let you know that, um, you know, the Africa Foundation for Development is a, was the pioneering organization founded in the UK. Uh, that was looking at the role of the diaspora um, and it was funded, I don't remember the exact year, but it was sort of like um, maybe late 80s, something like that. Can... No, 1994. 94, okay, yes, yeah, so I mean, a long time ago. Uh, so just to bear in mind, please do check out Afford and the work they've been doing uh, in relation to the African diaspora and its impact on, on the continent because uh, they've done a lot of different work in, in, in many different areas. Um, and this uh, project on Erite is one of the latest uh, um, endeavor. Uh, and Onikachi Wambo, he has been a journalist um, for many, many years. Um, he, was, um, he started off as a journalist and uh, um, a television documentary maker, one of the first, again, pioneering in uh, bringing to the screen uh, um, African history. Um, he's also written widely on Africa, the global diaspora, um, and, um, is, um, and also to say that he's a trustee of the African Social Justice Platform Fahamo, which is a very uh, important platform. Um, so please do uh, check them out. Um, and he's also a member of the London School of Economic, Media and Communication Advisory Group, uh, as well as uh, um, a senior associate um, of the Foreign Policy Center, among other things. And um, I am, um, um, you know, th there will be so much more to say <laughs> about Onyekachi that I might personally known for many years and uh, I highly respect. Um, secondly, I thank you. To... I'll just correct you. The, the media group on the LSE is no longer functioning, but, but okay, thank you. No problem. But thank you. Thank you for a very generous. <laughs> thank you for no, a very I'm generous write up, yes. otherwise. You're welcome. Um, and just a few words about Paul Asquith, who is a colleague of uh, Onyekachi. Paul joined Afford a few years ago uh, from SOAS, in fact. Paul uh, graduated from SOAS and he was also, um, is also a research associate at the SOAS Center of African Studies. And he has been doing work on the diaspora again uh, for many years and uh, focusing on issues of migration, development, um, um, and engagement um, with um, uh, uh, on the continent, uh, um, um, quite you know specific so what I really like about Afford is they are a diaspora organization but very much working on the continent and engaging um, in that area so do uh, keep an eye on the uh, return of the icons um, because there will be a lot more interesting things coming up. Uh, now we are moving on to um, an another project um, uh, about repatriation um, very interesting the Mangi uh, Meli project 
Um, and we have here um, two members of the team. Uh, the team is, is a much larger, um, is a team uh, that combines members from, the, uh, from Tanzania, obviously um, from the UK and Germany. Um, and uh, we, um, we, uh, we were supposed to actually have here today as well representative from the Tanzanian team. Unfortunately, they were not able to join us, uh, but um, I understand that they will come in in the Q&A. So we can then um, hear from them um, at that point. Uh, I'll now briefly introduce Esbeth Court, our first speaker of the Mangimeli project. Esbeth is a specialist in African art and art education, uh, and she's been teaching at SOAS for many, many years. Um, uh, during the late 60s, she was a secondary school teacher of African history on Mount Kilimanjaro, and she joined the author and edited several of our volumes, more recently, a specialist on Kenyan art world for critical interventions. A journal of African art and visual culture. Uh, in 2009, uh, to, um, 2019, she curated the Hassan Musa, the artist stamp at the Brunei Gallery in Soas, uh, where she taught African art uh, for nearly three decades. Um, and she was also consultant for many um, uh, series, including the BBC, a recent series that hopefully you've seen, African Renaissance, when Art Meets Power, uh, that was uh, presented by Afua Hirsch, and then Esbeth was uh, one of the consultants on the program. Um, then uh, the second participant uh, from the Mangimeli project is uh, Konradin Kunze, uh, he's joining us from Berlin, uh, and he's been, um, and he's going to show us an animation uh, that he produced um, as part of the project, um, and um, um, Konradin is a um, um, he holds an MA in acting from the Endover University of Music, Drama and Media. Uh, and he, he, he was an actor for several years and now he moved on into documentary making. Uh, and he, um, um, through Flynn Works, uh, the company, he produced several projects dealing with the German colonial history. Um, I won't uh, uh, say any, any more. I will let them uh, tell us about the project. And um, we now, um, I give the floor to Elsbeth, and then um, uh, we will have the short animation um, made by Conrad, and then Conrad will come in to uh, discuss the animation and the project as a whole. So now, uh, with no further ado, Elsbeth Court, uh, please uh, uh, welcome, and, and um, yeah, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone who's actually watching from all over the world. It's quite a wonderful idea just to think about uh, our, our viewers. Uh, first, I have would like, can you hear me? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, first, I'd like to make a uh, thank you, so a bit of a testimony. Uh, I'd to thank Stephanie and Angelica for arranging and convening this panel and to give special thanks uh, to and. Angelica for many, many years of joint ventures in pursuit of our mutual passions, African art and Swahili language and civilization. Uh, I'd like to extend my deep gratitude uh, to the program. Uh, so as decolonization on two levels, specific and general, specifically uh, for a grant that enabled the July 2019 international in-person workshop, Vizazi, Contemporary Visual Culture of Tanzania Vizazi means uh, generations in Kiswahili, and we were concerned with the connections between generations in art practices and critical studies. It was an effort to lessen uh, the lacuna uh, about Tanzanian contemporary and modern art, uh, which uh, in, especially in terms of the region where both Kenya and Uganda at this point are, are noted for their extroversion. Uh, if you wish to know more about the Vizazi workshop, I have a blog under SOAS, blog SOAS, uh, the decolonizing SOAS, uh, and I can send a link if anybody's interested in that. But what I'd like to emphasize here is just how awed I was by the presentation for Mangi Meli Remains, a multidimensional collaborative heritage and art project that was inspired by the long a long lasting campaign for the return of Chaga chief Mele's missing head uh, to Tanzania for proper burial. There's been, it's been a 50 year campaign by his grandson, uh, which uh, Conradin will say more about. The presenter was the co-curator of the uh, project, 
uh, Sarita Mamsiri, also a so whom I met at SOAS when she was doing her MA. And today she's preoccupied uh, in a good diaspora way with Black History Month. Uh, there was also, uh, uh, we saw at the time of the panel, this little booklet. This is one of the documents, very precious document uh, that uh, Conrad and the team made. And I'll just show one page or two pages actually, and you can see them uh, this way drawing and photographs. And this was one of the things that was most exciting about uh, the project is that it use, or uses so many forms of uh, uh, visual information to communicate the story of Manguelian German colonialism. So there's a booklet and a blog. And then more generally, uh, my deep gratitude to the decolonization program because it offered me, I'm quite an aged, uh, academic at this point and, and indeed retired from teaching, uh, the opportunity, the mental space in which to revisit and reflect upon my professional life in which decolonization has been a recurrent theme, albeit with different, different labels, different labels. In Tanzania, it was curriculum reform. In Kenya, it was revision of the uh, school art syllabus with material culture. And I'm taking that as a newspaper headline in 1985 all that's left of that reform is actually drawing, but that's another story. Um, while in London, uh, it, the decolonization, has taken the form of extending canons for art history, both Western and Africanist, to create spaces for practices of contemporary artists and with attention to artist-led non-formal learning and events. Then I'd like to say a few words about the terminology for our panel. A heritage, I think, really excited that this word is there and I uh, responding uh, immediately to uh, a Ford's notion that it should be dynamic, uh, to, that it is dynamic, uh, to uh, reimagine development as a cultural project. Uh, to me, uh, I use, that's a paraphrase actually from Basu and Modest, uh, the active presence of, of the past in the present and something based on inheritance, uh, the power to shape and current predispositions and visions for the future. Uh, so I'm very happy with that word, but I'm not so happy with repatriation because it's just so blunt and it's concerned only with return. To me, uh, not to me, but to the dictionary, uh, it means the return of a person to their nation, uh, repatriation. And this is to me uh, connotes a very home office context uh, within the UK. Uh, I prefer the word, uh, which I think has a more elastic concept, restitution which Afford is using, uh, and the root word for that is to set up as an act of restoring a memory, a context, and includes the return of something or its equivalent. Sometimes maybe the skull doesn't matter so much, but it's the story uh, that we need to uh, focus on. Uh, so, uh, then art, because I'm switching the conversation a bit into art practices. Uh, art in the context of this so as festival has been enlightening to me because so many of the speakers have talked about alternative ways of learning, a real advocacy towards ways of learning that are not text-based. These of course are art. And art is another way of knowing. It involves expression, it has agency. It reaches places uh, that a page or a screen of words cannot. It's an open context. There are many kinds of art making. And herein, with the Mangi Meli remains, we're looking at a postmodern, research led, site specific installation. It's had three different iterations uh, to tell Meli's story and that of German East Africa. And it's by definition a, a transnational work. Now let's move on to the exhibition. I was uh, I was certainly awed, as I've already said, in July uh, 2019 by Sarita's presentation, so much so that when I was visiting uh, my family in Kenya last uh, winter, European winter, uh, in, I took time in January 2020 to visit uh, the site of uh, Wanky Meli remains, and I was humbled when visiting the project site at Old Moshi, uh, to Suni, a rural village in the foothills of Kilimanjaro, about 20 minutes off the main road. Very bumpy road. It had been raining, so it was also slippery. Uh, so a real sense of adventure in actually getting there. Uh, it is a cultural landscape, to use uh, the language nowadays uh, uh, for heritage. A, column, a solemn site of remembrance, 
On the right is the acacia tree from which the German colonials hanged Chief Milley and I think 17 of his mates. And under the tree is a conventional portrait head. And to the left of the tree is the old courthouse in which the exhibition is installed in a white washed square room. You couldn't get more white cube in, in terms of contemporary art, minimalist modern. Uh, the walls are divided into three sections life, death, and thereafter, with fascinating period photographs, uh, I, just actually very exciting to look at, and it certainly captivated the uh, groups of students um, whom we brought into the uh, ex uh, exhibition for workshops. And in the center is the video sculptor, uh, which I will leave uh, for Conradin to explain. The complex at uh, Old Moshi is managed by Gabby Mzeo Rio, uh, head and founder of the Old Moshi Cultural Tourism. He has a selection of paintings in his office and the booklet that I showed you earlier is available there for sale. We hope later to have copies here, here meaning in London uh, for sale as well. The excellent arrangements for my visit were made by Gabby. Uh, I should just say I went with three, uh, three of us went, uh, three old uh, teachers from Machami and Old Moshi School in the late 60s. And we really had that sort of time of our life. It was an extremely uh, excellent uh, visit. I have been back before, but they had not. Uh, now, let me relate very briefly, I can see my time is going to run out, uh, to uh, MMR to the Ford policy brief, and in particular to the four track approach. Just one thing before I, uh, no, I'll come, I'll show this last actually. Um, from what I understand, the German institutions have actually changed their laws to force their um, institutions to be more cooperative uh, with the groups that are seeking uh, to restore particularly human remains. Uh, but however, uh, in terms of the other aspects, uh, in particular, whether or not uh, symbolism is actually a good way to um, capture the restitution or not. Uh, Conrad wrote to me a, a few days ago, the story for the search for the head is a story of rejections. And I notice he's using the word head, I sometimes use skull, uh, that there are no voluntary return uh, agreements and no symbolic acts. Mangi Meli remains a placeholder for Mangi Meli's head rather than a symbolic restitution. It marks the wound, but does not heal it. And I'll just say that we, we have actually tried a bit with the uh, Tanzanian diaspora here in London. This is the magazine that, or lovely journal that goes with the British and Tanzania Society uh, with a, a Mangi Mali on the cover in one of these photographs and also a, a three page article. We didn't, to my knowledge, have any um, responses. I think we need to try harder um, with the diaspora community here and perhaps we can work with Afford in that regard. So I think that's all I have to say and I should pass uh, to, Conra to Conradian and Conradin and the uh, animation. Should I turn off my mute? Um, yes, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And we are now going to show a short animation. Um, if uh, Kunmi, uh, would you mind starting it? And then Conrad will come in after the animation. So here we go. Na uwana huu mti ni mti wa mgunga. Jyo hapa mjuku wangu. Huu mti una historia kusimulia. Ni kuhusu babu yetu nishudia sikiliza. Takriban 
walikuwa ni waafrika lakini walikuwa wanamilikiwa na watu weupe walikuwa ni askari kwenye jeshi la kikoloni la Kijerumani Askari aliyekufa aliimaanisha kisasi. Maafisa wa Kijerumani walishajua ni nani wa kumlaumu ni babu yangu. Yeye alikuwa chifu mpya wa Moshi. walikuwa na chuki tele juu yake kwa sababu hakuwakubali Unaona huu mti ni mti wa mgunga Njoo hapa mjuku wangu Huu mti una historia ya kusimulia ni kuhusu babu yetu shujaa sikiliza takriban miaka 130 iliyopita alikuwa na msichana sokoni alikuwa amebeba viazi vitamu mara ghafla akakutana na watu wa kenya njia walikuwa ni waafrika lakini walikuwa wanamilikiwa na watu weupe walikuwa ni askari kwenye jeshi la kikoloni la kijerumani Askari aliyekufa aliimaanisha kisasi. Maafisa wa Kijerumani walishajua ni nani wa kumlaumu ni babu yangu. Yeye alikuwa chifu mpya wa Moshi. Walikuwa na chuki tele juu yake kwa sababu hakuwakubali Wajerumani kwenye himaya yake. Jina lake alikuwa Meli alichoshwa na ukatili kwa watu wake Hongeo mwanzo wa vita Miaka michache kabla ya Kaizari huko Berlin kutangaza kuwa pande kubwa la ardhi kuwa ni mali ya Ujerumani ardhi ambayo hakujua aliita Ujerumani Afrika Mashariki lakini mwaka 1892 askari wake walipotea kwenye msitu kwenye ardhi waliodai ni koloni lao askari wa kikoloni walionusurika kwa kipigo walikimbia hadi pwani kwa mwaka mzima jeshi la kikoloni halikuthubutu kupigana na meli ni baada ya governor wa Kijerumani kukusanya nguvu kubwa ya kijeshi akapanga shambulizi linalofuata 
mara hii walileta bombom na mizinga hawakujua mahala hasa ilipokuwa boma la meli kwa kubatisha tu mzinga lakini walipoingia kwenye mabaki ya nyumba ya meli walikuta kitu cha ajabu baba yake meli chief rindi mandala alikaribisha aina sote za wageni moshi ili kutanua uwezo wake alituma ujumbe wa mashujaa wake kwenda Berlin kukutana na Kaisari ilikuwa ni safari iliyojaa changamoto za ajabu bali na maafisa lakini pia kulikuwa na watu wengine waliotamani kukutana na ujumbe kutoka Kilimanjaro wana science walichukua kila aina ya vipimo na picha wakirudi kutoka Ujerumani wapiganaji waliwakilisha zawadi kutoka kwa Kaisari kwa Chief Rind miongoni mwao ikiwa ni kisanduku chenye mziki sasa imeharibiwa na mzinga ya Kijerumani lakini meli alikuwa wapi Atuo amepoteza zaidi ya mashujaa 100 moja meli ikabidi ajisalimishe jetzt gemerkt dass die deutschen stärker sind als du sasa umeona kuwa wajerumani wana nguvu kuliko ulivyo ndio bwana ili kuokoa maisha ya watu meli ilimbidi akubali mashariti yaliyowekwa na gavana ilimbidi kukabidhi bunduki zake zote ilimbidi akabidhi pembe za ndovu na agawe chakula ilibidi atoe mali na wafanyakazi ili kujenga kambi ya kijeshi ya Wajerumani kwa miaka saba, meli alifumilia utawala wa Kijerumani alitaba saa mbele ya kamera alikunywa mbege alikata tamaa alipoteza ali hasira yake au kwa siri alikuwa anajenga muungano na maachifu wengine ili kuwafukuza wakoloni mara moja na milele maadui wa siku nyingi wa meli wakawatahadharisha kwa Jerumani juu ya njamaa hapa meli na wenzake wanataka kuwashambulia kituo chao usiku askari waliotahadharishwa walipiga kila ulichodhania kwa ni washambuliaji punde jeshi la kikoloni likapanga kuadhibu wale wote wanaotuhumiwa kula njama chief meli machifu wenzake kadhaa na viongozi wakakamatwa kishtie 19 kati yao akiwemo babu yangu Mary waliohukumiwa kifo asubuhi ya tarehe mbili machi mwaka 1900 Watu wa Moshi waliitwa kusanyike pamoja chini ya mti wa mgonga. Chief Mary alikuwa jasiri. Alinigimia kwenye mti kwa saa saba na hakufa. Ndiyo, alikuwa shujaa wa kweli. Unadhani simulizi hii inaishia hapa? Hapana sikiliza ni hadithi wa kuwa wakati huo huko Berlini wa Jeremani iliwabidi wajenge sehemu mpya itakayowafutia zaidi wageni ilikuwa ni jengo la makumbusho ambalo litaonyesha vitu vingi ambavyo wajerumani waliviona kuvipenda 
na kupibeba kote duniani waliliita jengo la makumbusho la ethnologia nimejifunza kuhusu mtu mmoja anaitwa Felix von Lusham mwanasayansi aliyefanya kazi kwenye jengo la makumbusho von Lusham lazima alikuwa ni mtu wa ajabu sana niliambiwa alikuwa anavutiwa na ukusanyaji wa mafu ya watu aliwaomba marafiki zake weupe kwenye makoloni ya Kijerumani wa mtumia mabaki ya mifupa ya watu kwa maana hiyo walichukua vichwa vya watu na bibi yangu ndiye aliyeniambia kuwa walichukua kichwa cha babu yangu Mary miaka kadhaa baadaye niliona nyaraka inayothibitisha kuwa mafuu mengi yalitumwa na chifu mweupe wa kambi ya kijeshi ya Kijerumani baadaye nilifahamu kuwa wanasayansi wengi Ujerumani na nchi nyingine hukusanya mafu ya watu kuwa wanayasafirisha kutoka jumba moja la makumbusho kwenda jingine na kufanya kila aina ya vipimo majaribio mbali mbali ili kuthibitisha nini kwamba wao wamestarabika zaidi kuliko sisi lakini nauliza ni ustarabu kukata kichwa cha mtu na kukichukua kama zawadi wakati huo sisi tungelistiri kwenye sehemu yenye heshima sana kwenye migomba nikihifadhiwa na chungu tungeenda pale ili kuomba kwa wahenga kutupatia mibaraka tunahitaji kirudishwe inawezekana kikawepo mahali fulani kwenye jumba la makumbusho au kimepotea moja kwa moja nimesubiri kwa muda mrefu babu kurejea nimeuliza nimetafiti sasa mimi ni mzee niambie che nikate tamaa na niache tu hili liende hapana babu usikate tamaa tuka pamoja mapambano lazima yaendelee Great thank you so much Kumni for showing the video and now I would like to pass it on to Conradin um, to tell us more about the animation Conradin the floor is yours Thank you Angelica um so I'm not sure if if uh, if you could all see it smoothly uh, I think there was some technical issue at least with my computer with the animation and the the sound is actually much more smoothly than it appeared at my screen at least, but I hope you got a sense of uh, the story. So um, first of all, I would like to, th to thank you all uh, for having me here on this panel. And um, I have to thank my team too, because it's actually, it's really a, a big team um, that was involved in the Mangimeli Remains project. Uh, most of them never met in person because it's really transcontinental. Uh, we even had an animator from Canada, and then of course a lot of Tanzanians, uh, Germans, and uh, and a Londoner. Um, they cannot be here right now, but um, I'm just speaking uh, for them, so I'm just part of this um, team. And actually, as you might have seen in the animation and the story, um, also the the story that is told is a transnational story 
in that sense that we also used um, material from many continents, um, mainly, of course, uh, Germany and Tanzania um, countries. But um, so the main source, of course, was oral history um, brought to us by Isaria Meli, the grandson of uh, Chief Meli. And um, but there were also other um, oral reports. There is this song uh, by Charles um, Rema, Mary Charles Rema, who's uh, which is in in the um, in the film, and uh, it's a song about about Meli and about his death that is uh, passed on over the generations to her. And on the other side, we also used uh, resources, mainly colonial resources in the archives that we could find in Germany, and um, it's a combination of all of this in, in the project. The project itself is more than this film. This film is actually just um, one of the outcomes, as Elspeth pointed out, it's, it's mainly an exhibition um, that traveled from Germany to um, Tanzania and finally to, to Old Moshi, where it is situated right now. And um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of pictures um, that we found in, in archives. And I just want to briefly say something about um, the project itself, how, how it came into being. And this is a long story. I tried to cut it short. Um, basically, Flynnworks is a theater company. I'm a, um, a theater practitioner. And um, more than 12 years ago, um, my partner and I, we were invited uh, to Tanzania to, to conduct a workshop at uh, the Goethe Institute in, in, in Dar es Salaam. And that was a moment of shock for us because it was the first time that we really heard about our own colonial history because it's not taught in schools in Germany. It changed a little bit today, but, um, but uh, at that time we didn't hear anything about it. So out of that moment from shock and shame, uh, we decided to make uh, theater projects and um, with some of the uh, participants of the workshop and um, one project which came into life much later I, um, was Maji Maji Flavor. And it was, um, yeah, performance music, theater performance, Tanzanian, German mixed team about the Maji Maji war and uh, the different perceptions um, of history in Tanzania and, and Germany. And we performed it in, in both countries. And, um, Another project that came out of that, actually, uh, out of the research, was a project that was called Skull X or Schädel X in German. Uh, it's a very small project. Um, it's a lecture performance done by me, and that focuses only on the topic of um, ancestral remains, like rem human remains from the colonial era um, in German collections or even in private households. And um, this was about two stories. Uh, real stories. One is that of a German person who kind of inherits a skull um, from his great uh, uncle who was a missionary in Namibia and uh, that person tries to find out um, whose skull that was and tries to to return it to Namibia and it's quite a journey and a challenge. And the other one was that of Mangimeli and uh, the search for his head. And um, I came across the story of Mangi Meli and the search uh, more or less by accident on the internet, on Facebook. I, saw, I found an old article, a newspaper, local newspaper article uh, from Arusha about uh, Isaria Meli trying to find the head of um, his grandfather. And um, so I traveled there and met him, Isaria, and he was very welcoming and friendly and open hearted. And he told uh, the story and um, we were allowed to record him on video. So he became part mm -hmm. of the, this um, lecture performance. And um, the lecture performance also featured some other people who were searching for the same head. And um, I come to that a little bit later. But um, this performance was mainly done in Germany, but we were able to perform it in, in Tanzania uh, twice in Dar es Salaam and the Goethe Institute. And on this occasion, we invited, of course, Isaria Meli. Um, to be our honorable guest. And he brought uh, with him Gabi Mzeoriu, who is um, in the chat right now. I'm not sure if the um, internet connection is stable, but um, 
so a young um, guy from from uh, old Moshi who is uh, running this old uh, Moshi cultural tourism enterprise and after the performance they asked me so thank you Conradin for all this information that you gathered and found in archives and uh, in Germany and pictures and so on but how can we make that information available for the community of old Moshi and that was and is a very valid question so I said, okay, we really need to do something about this. Um, it's not enough to tell the story in Germany. Uh, so this was basically the idea to create this exhibition and, and this film. The film itself is, was made um, for a video sculpture, a video installation. Uh, so the, the, the animation is actually projected onto a broken clay pot and um, you can press several buttons uh, for different languages. Um, and the film that you have just seen is, is mainly a um, follow project uh, just to make this animation available for festivals and later also for, for public online, um, just to spread uh, the story a little bit uh, further than Old Moshi itself. But yeah, the reason that's the reason why we created Mangimeli um, Remains and um, Several things happened on the sidetrack here because it was not only the exhibition, it was also the memorial, like a statue of, of Mangimeli uh, that was created. And um, it's now there under the tree where Mangimeli was hanged, uh, as Elspeth um, described. And, um, but apart from these, let's say, artistic approaches, um, also, what we did um, is we joined forces to find the head uh, of Mangimeli, which we didn't succeed until now. So um, the exhibition is really a placeholder, and I hope one day we will manage and bring the head back to where it belongs. And um, this search, the quest for, for the head is really a long, long um, search done by different people, um, different individuals. It's not only Saria Meli. Um, who um, is really a muse, an old man now in his 80s, in his late 80s. And what he did is he tried to find it with his means, um, that is talking to local authorities, to politicians uh, in Tanzania, to urge the German government to search for the head and bring it back. And what he manages in, uh, in the year 2000, he, um, he could reach the German ambassador at that time, and the ambassador then replied to him, well, I have asked some museums and they said they don't have the skull, so uh, we cannot help you any further. And um, so Isaria merely tried to tell the story and, uh, and there were several people that were really actually trying to help him find the skull um, or the head in, in Germany. Uh, one of them being a private lady, uh, Christina Helbig, who heard this story and then tried to find it. Um, and actually Christina Helbig then handed over all her research that she had done so far to me when she heard that I'm searching um, too. And then there is another very important person. Um, it's Mnyaka Sururu Mboro, who is a Tanzanian um, who lives in Berlin since the seventies. And uh, he is an activist and um, actually Mboro comes from a neighboring village of Old Moshi. So he's not a direct descendant of Mangimeli, but he is, um, he heard the same story and um, his grandmother told him when he went to Germany um, to study, uh, she told him, well, if you go there, you have to bring back the head of Mangimeli. So it's also his lifelong quest to find it, uh, to locate it and find it and bring it back. But um, he again, um, was rejected so many times in his life by institutions uh, on his quest. He's not only searching for this head, but he is a political activist in that sense that he urges these institutions to confront their colonial history and um, also to bring, uh, to give back art um, artifacts and so on. And it's actually due to him and his organization, Berlin Postcolonial and other NGOs, um, and actors from the civil society in Germany, that those institutions started slowly to move and to actually hand over some of these ancestral remains um, 
back to their communities, but it's really a long way to go. And he was like, in the, in the beginning, he was uh, always rejected saying, no, he's not a scientist, so we cannot give you any information. He, um, he was rejected in several ways. And actually these rejections are, as I see it, um, continuation of colonial violence that, that happens today. And, um, but finally, uh, now these huge skull collections or human remains collections in Berlin, they are with the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. And what we found out is um, we didn't find a document saying that, like a written document saying that um, Mangemeli's skull was sent um, to, to Berlin, but there is a direct link because there is this officer, this colonial officer, uh, Moritz Merkel, who was at the military station in Morshi. And we have proved that he sent several boxes of skeletons and skulls um, to Berlin, to this museum, uh, which is the Ethnological uh, Museum, uh, to this person, Felix von Lushan. And um, unfortunately, uh, some of these uh, heads, they are um, lost there. So they came into the collection, but um, they are not there anymore. And this has to do probably also uh, with the history of the collection uh, and World War II. So some parts of the collection were destroyed. Also many documents were destroyed during World War II. And um, it was relocated several times. And also during the GDR, some of um, the skulls uh, disappeared. So it's until today unclear if the head of Mangimeli um, is still in the collection or not, or where it is today. But what we managed to do is, um, we managed to invite Isaria, Meli, and Gabi to Berlin. So um, in his late 80s, this, this Mze boarded a plane for the first time and then came to Berlin to speak at a conference and his voice was heard for the first time in Berlin. And um, on this occasion, I arranged a meeting with him and um, Boro and uh, the, the president of the cultural um, Prussian Heritage Foundation. And on this occasion, they, they took a DNA sample of Isari Amelie and later they took also uh, two other samples of families uh, from the region, Kilimanjaro region, who are missing their um, ancestors. And uh, they um, conducted some research. So um, they, they were looking into the, uh, the collections, especially for the East German East African uh, collection of those heads and um, bones. And they couldn't find a match where I have to say they, they tested six of these um, skulls and there are more that could have, could have been tested. Um, but they came to the conclusion that uh, the, the head of Mangimeli remains is not in their collection, which is possible. It could be because at that time there was a human remains trafficking network in place. So these institutions at that time also exchanged um, um, people like uh, uh, heads and, and skeletons and so on. And it's not very well documented. So it's even possible that it could be somewhere else in the world, uh, not even in Germany. So the search is ongoing. And um, well, the next step, actually what we try to do with the joint forces to make sure that all of the human remains in all the German institutions uh, are going to be uh, returned to Tanzania and um, make we start to focus uh, on the Kilimanjaro region and already um, made arrangements there. And I hope that this will come true in, in the future. But um, Isaria asked me, so should I, should I lose hope that this head was, is ever going to come back? And I had to say, well, I don't know if we're ever going to find him, but he said, well, maybe he will live as long and to this 